Can you hear me? My name is Howie Hawkins. I'm the Green Party candidate for governor of New York. And are we live? Doesn't look like here we are. There's a delay. Oh, okay. There's a delay. Um, we're getting used to this modern technology. So I'm here in the storefront that the Green Party has in Syracuse, New York, uh, to respond to the debate we just had between Andy Cuomo and Cynthia Nixon. And I'm not going to engage in the personal sniping which seemed to dominate the debate. I want to talk about real policy issues. Also about problems we have upstate. This seemed to be a very New York City centric debate, even though the city does have big problems. And, you know, the big problems for all of us, upstate or downstate, is that wages have been down for decades. The real average wages of workers today are the same as they were in 1974, but our rent, health care, college, and lately food have been going up and up. And those of us upstate have seen our property taxes go up and up. And so I felt like I was listening to two Clinton Democrats. Obviously, Andrew Cuomo's a Democrat. People may not know that Cynthia Nixon maxed out in donations to Hillary Clinton against Bernie Sanders, including the New York presidential primary, and added another $5,000 to the Hillary Victory Fund, which collaborated with the Democratic National Committee against Sanders' campaign. And I think when she was talking about uh, voting for Andrew Cuomo in 2010, when he was obviously going after the public unions and the public sector and proposing an austerity budget, which she later criticized, but at the time she endorsed him, um, I think, you know, that's just a confusion I think there is in the Democratic Party. And it, and I, okay, I'll, so that's enough said on that. So now let's just go through some of the issues. Uh, unequal school of funding came up uh, and Cynthia Nixon pointed out that we have the second most unequal funding between schools. We also are just underfunded by a cumulative $4.2 billion, according to the Foundation Aid Formula enacted in 2007, uh, which was enacted in response to the Campaign for Fiscal Equity case in order to provide adequate funds, particularly to the high poverty school districts, so that every child in the state could have a sound basic education. The state has been short on that. Certainly in my city of Syracuse, many parts of the state as well. And actually my city, the parents of my city, Syracuse, and the parents of New York City are in suit together against the state for underfunding. There's another lawsuit, seven small cities, and Governor Cuomo has the attorney general defending the state underfunding the schools. And I think that's something that we ought to keep in mind and should have been mentioned. Um, when it comes to education, there are other big issues. High stakes testing, which is not about education, but ranking teachers, ranking schools, ranking students, in order to basically define the high poverty schools as failing so they can turn them over to the charter school industry where hedge fund investors can double their money in seven years because of the new markets tax credit. And it's a scam. It's not about education, it's about business. And that needs to be stopped. And then we have the most segregated schools in the nation in our cities in New York State. There's no discussion of that. So I wish they'd gone into the whole educational policy. The question of low wages did come up. And Cynthia Nixon criticized Cuomo for only going for $10.50 an hour at first instead of $15 an hour. But what she should have pointed out is they're not anywhere near 15 in most of the state. We're at $10.40 an hour right now. That's still a poverty wage. And what I'm saying is we got to get the 15 faster. We now got to start talking about $20 an hour in a way to ramp that up in the next few years. So when people go to work, they can come home and pay their bills without worrying about paying the rent and their other bills and maybe even staying in their home. They talked about homelessness. People are being pushed out because they can't afford the rent. They aren't getting paid enough to pay the rent. And I would also like to point out that today there was a hearing in a, a New York State Supreme Court about uh, by home attendants who are suing the state for a regulation that Andrew Cuomo's Department of Labor has put in place in defiance of three court decisions already in the state that permits the employers of these home attendants to put these people who are home attendants on 24 hour shifts, but only pay them for 13 hours. You know, that other 11 hours of slavery, that's supposed to be illegal. And I wish, uh, well, Governor Cuomo could end that right now by just getting on the Department of Labor but apparently uh, low-wage workers are not high on these candidates' minds. Um, 
And then climate. It came up briefly when Cynthia Nixon touted the Climate and Community Protection Act, which if you read that is, it only comes to 100% clean energy by 2050. And if you look at the global carbon budgets that the climate scientists have uh, developed to keep us below two degrees rise in Celsius, which will keep us from runaway global warming and a climate catastrophe, we've got to get to 100% clean energy by 2030. So it's, I think, really irresponsible to tout this bill, which the Democratic Assembly passed, and not go for the bill which the science says we need to do. And that bill is called New York Off, Off Fossil Fuels. It's in the legislature. It's something I've campaigned for since 2010, again in 2014. Now we got legislation, and in this election, we want to make sure that, that we get to that, uh, get that bill front and center because what's been proposed and adopted by the assembly just doesn't get the job done. And when people think of climate change, they think of extreme weather and the sea rising. We're talking about food production not getting done. We're talking about mass refugee. We're talk talking about conflicts between nations over dwindling resources. This is a real catastrophe and it's pending. We're about to have uh, methane bombs coming out of the Arctic in the tundra because it's melting. And methane is 86 times more potent over the first 20 years it's in the atmosphere than carbon. I mean, we're on a precipice of a real disaster. And these candidates have not really put that front and center. They did talk about the MTA and uh, Cynthia Nixon's right that the MTA has been an ATM, not just for Andrew Cuomo, as she said, he has taken money out of there and put it into the other program over the last eight years. But the, AT, or the MTA is basically, they've, gone and, they've done too much debt financing instead of taxing the rich up front. Now we borrow money by going to the bond market and then paying interest for it. And the debt service costs in the MTA are through the roof. And that's what I meant when I first said, I said it in the 2010 governor's debate that the MTA or the bank, they're letting the banks use the MTA as an ATM. Um, now Cuomo said the state can't pick up the finances, nonsense. Since 1980, the top 1% in this state share of income has gone from 12% to 30%. And their taxes have been cut. And one of the things Nixon says is she loved Mary Cuomo. Unfortunately, I hate to report that it was under him that the tax structure was flattened. And the bottom bracket was doubled from 2% to 4% for low wage workers. And the top bracket was cut in more than half. If we went back to the tax structure we had in the 1970s before Cuomo and the other, it was the Reaganites and the Democrats together who basically went on this uh, trickle down economics where you give the rich more money, it's supposed to trickle down the rest of us, of course it doesn't. Um, if we went back to that tax structure in the 1970s, we'd have $10 billion more a year. We kept the stock transfer tax, which they stopped keeping in 1981. Today they collect it and give it right back to Wall Street. That's up to $15 billion a year. And then we got the Trump corporate uh, tax cut windfall that corporations here in New York are getting. That's almost $10 billion. And if we claw that back, we got $35 billion a year. And the MTA's uh, fast forward plan that the new director, Andy Byford, put forward is a cost of $38 billion over, or $37 billion over 10 years. Cuomo talked about incrementally increasing the funding. You won't do it unless you tax the rich. And the state has the capacity to do that. Rather than putting it on the municipality in New York City, sure, they should put some in. Andy Byford wants that. But the state has primary responsibility because they have a wider tax jurisdiction. And if you raise the taxes among municipalities, then it's called tax jurisdiction competition. And businesses, you know, move and then municipalities lower their taxes and try to get business. And it's a race to the bottom. We don't want to get into that. Single payer. I thought actually Cynthia Nixon made a pretty good presentation on why we need single payer. Cuomo said, where do you get the money? And I wish Nixon had done the rejoinder, but I'll do it right now. It's in the proposal, it's in the text. It's a payroll tax on both the employer and the employee, it's progressive. And then there's an additional tax on the earned, unearned income of this 1% that gets $30, $375 billion a year. That's what they got last year. You can look it up in the Federal Reserve, St. Louis Federal Reserve, they keep track of the state by state. They're getting 30% of the income, find that total, it's $375 billion. And they can pay some taxes on their unearned income from interest, rent, and capital gains. That's how it's financed, Governor Cuomo. And I think you know that, but you don't want to tax the rich. That's been a problem, you know, for you and your father. 
And then we got the ethics. And Governor Cuomo said legislators should have no outside income. Uh, I would do it like Congress, where the outside income is limited, but I think we're on the same page there. More disclosure, fine. And then he talked about campaign finance reform. Didn't say what reform. And Nixon said she wanted to close the LLC loophole, fine, and restart the Moreland Commission. Neither of them laid out a plan for full public campaign finance, which is the clean money model, which Maine uses, Arizona uses, and what it means is if you opt in, you don't use private money, you use nothing but clean public money. You get enough money to contact all the voters with your message, and everybody it's a level playing field for those that opt in. And now you don't have to opt in because of the Vallejo versus Buckley Supreme Court decision. And that's something we can't change in the state. Uh, instead, we've had proposals before the state legislature for partial public funding on the New York City model where you add a little public money on top of the whole big pile of private money. You don't change the system. You just put a little, uh, make it look better than it is. So I'm for full public campaign finance, and I think that's really the way to get the private money out of public elections so we can have fair elections where everybody's point of view is out there on a level playing field. Uh, the marijuana question, they are both for legalization sooner or later. Uh, the question to Nixon on uh, won't it cause the youth to use it? I mean, don't you think the youth are using it now? You know, it's like tobacco and alcohol. Prohibition doesn't work. So prohibiting, prohibiting marijuana isn't stopping the youth from using it. But what has reduced tobacco is public education and also alcoholism to an extent. So this needs to be seen as a public health issue, not a criminal problem. And prohibition isn't going to stop the kids from going out and getting some weed. It requires education. And uh, sanctions still for those that uh, sell the uh, marijuana to underage people. Uh, the question of should public employees be able to strike? And you know, my position is, of course, if you can't strike, you're really in slavery. But actually, Governor Cuomo was right when he said the public employee unions, unions are not calling for this. And Cynthia Nixon kind of jumped out on it. And I know, being a member of labor unions for 50 years or so, that you don't want to get into a fight without being organized and prepared. And to raise this issue without it coming from the unions, and particularly the rank and file, I'm not sure it's a good time. She was right that the uh, strikes taken by the teachers in those right to work states had a good positive impact. But I happen to know that they were prepared. In fact, one of the people helping prepare them was my running mate, Gia Lee, who's a public school teacher in New York and one of the top notch, most top notch labor organizers, teachers organizers in the country. So uh, when the employee unions are ready to you know, fight for that, I'm with them. In the meantime, what could happen, which was happening back in 2010, when Governor Cuomo was running his first time and Stephanie Minor at that time running, or just had been elected to mayor, they were calling for getting rid of the uh, Triborough Amendment, which is the compromise. You can't strike, but your old contract stays in place and you can't negotiate by the time it expires. And that's the compromise we got in place. And at this point, the public employee unions have not shown an interest in raising that fight. If they want to, I will be there with them. Uh, and then, Two more to go, homelessness and housing. Uh, Governor Cuomo talked about needing supportive housing, it's called these for people with uh, substance abuse problems or mental or physical uh, issues. And there's an immediate need for 20,000 units. Governor Cuomo announced with much fanfare a $20 billion program back in 2016, but only a few hundred of millions out of that 20 billion have been released so far. So typically that's Cuomo talking left and walking right and being, you know, having public austerity when it comes to implementing that program. Those people are in crisis and need housing now. And then there's another 70 to 80,000 homeless people in New York state. And while I agree with Cynthia Nixon that rent control authority should be extended statewide, what is not said is that the authority should be in municipalities. We have a terrible law called the Erstad law since 1971 that has representatives of farmers in Wayne County in the legislature voting on rent control laws down in New York City. That makes no sense. It should be the people and their elected officials in New York City that decide their own rent control laws. So we gotta have home rule on rent control. Every municipality should have the right to it. 
and then they can decide how they're going to close these loopholes that were discussed. But the other thing that's missing is rent control will only help those people who we can get into rent control are already in it. We've lost since 1990, I think it's 245,000 units. We've lost 70,000 units of these loopholes in New York City since Governor Cuomo became governor. What we need is to expand public housing. Instead of subsidizing uh, affordable units by private developers, which is much more expensive, we should be expanding public housing. And this is where that tax program on the rich, a lot of this money should go into public housing. First, NYCHA needs $32 billion over the next five years just to get the lead out, remove the mold, get the elevators fixed, the boilers fixed, and the roofs fixed. And that's the first priority. But we need to expand public housing, to expand public uh, affordable housing, and this should not be the old, you know, huge giant projects that segregated poor people of color from the rest of the community. That was the wrong way to do it. These need to be high quality, maybe mixed income like they do in Europe. You have professionals, middle class, working class, poor people, all living in the same uh, developments. They should be scatter site and small scale, including in the suburbs. We need an inclusionary zoning law in this state. We need a law to uh, and source of income discrimination, which is usually used against Section 8 vouchers and people with other sources of income that landlords don't want. Sometimes it's veterans. There's a whole category, a whole number of categories. Um, and this housing should be powered by clean energy. This will create good jobs. It'll be a desegregation program. We are the most segregated housing in the country in our state. In the state. And it will be a clean energy program as well as an affordable uh, housing program. And then I want to conclude with a couple of things I didn't talk about. Issues we face upstate. Property taxes outside of New York City in the state are the highest in the nation. And they've been going up and up and up. Because what has happened since Mario Cuomo, right through Andrew Cuomo, they have imposed costs on local government through unfunded mandates and then forced us, local taxpayers, to balance the state budget by raising our local property taxes to pay for those unfunded mandates. And this actually goes back to Rockefeller when he had the Medicaid, which is the biggest unfunded mandate, have the counties pay for a quarter of it. Um, and then there's a tax cap, which Cuomo says he wants to keep. Nixon says she wants to improve by making it overridden by a simple majority instead of two thirds vote. I want to get rid of the tax cap. I want the state to pay for its uh, unfunded mandates share revenues like it used to. Andrew Cuomo's had the revenues frozen at four tenths of 1% of state revenues since he came into office and on to his budget plan for the future. It used to be 8% of state revenues back in the 1970s. So we restored revenue sharing, uh, pay for the unfunded mandates, and the local communities will be able to cut their property taxes as well as fully fund their services. And that's the way to cut property taxes. The tax cap is a joke. It's a good campaign slogan but it hasn't cut our property tax. And by the way, tenants, you're paying the landlord's property taxes and actually it's too hard than anybody. And then the other issue is upstate is we're depressed economically. And so we're calling for a Green New Deal for New York, which means a revitalization of the public sector, both infrastructure and services. So every community, and we invest this across upstate as well as the city, a good education for every child, comprehensive medical care through the single payer system, uh, a good, decent home for everybody, that's expanding the public housing, and moving to 100% clean energy by 2030, which will create hundreds of thousands of good jobs in construction and manufacturing, and actually lower electric rates in half. These programs will get a lot of people making good wages, there'll be multiplier effects, will get our economy going upstate, uh, as well as the rest of the state. And the last thing I'll say is there were a bunch of little short questions. The one I found interesting was, see, neither of them wanted uh, Mayor de Blasio's endorsement. Since they don't want it, I'll take it if he wants to get it. So with that, let's see what people have for questions. All right, first question. How can we make sure people of color who are incarcerated for marijuana offenses benefit from a legalized marijuana economy? Well, I think first we need to make sure anybody incarcerated has access to this. Um, and that means you got to keep big tobacco, big pharma, big alcohol out of this industry and regulate it so that small producers and distributors 
can take those jobs. And then people coming out of incarceration who are disproportionately people of color, but not only people of color, but they're white folks upstate and say, don't forget about us because we went through this misery too. They should all have the opportunity to get in that business. They have some experience in it, if that's what they want to do, or some other kind of retraining and support reintegrating into society. And uh, marijuana industry should be regular sales taxes. I don't see this as a big fundraiser for the state. You know, it should be taxed as well as regulated, but a regular sales tax, not a not a, a sin tax on it, so this business can thrive. And uh, I think just basically it needs to be regulated. And then uh, if there needs to be training, uh, people of color and other people coming out of incarceration, having the records expunged, should have the opportunity if they want it to go into that business. Education is a critical issue, hardly touched on. Formal has taken tremendous contributions from charter lobbyists. Yes, the hedge funds. He's championed reforms that have wreaked havoc, contributed to unprecedented inequities. Please talk about our position on public educational policies and our vision. And that actually comes from my running mate, Gia Lee. And maybe she wrote that before I outlined it. I don't want to go on too long. Uh, so I did talk about the high stakes testing and how that's not about education, it's about business, these hedge fund investors. Um, the tests, look, if you want to know how to, you know, we're doing on standardized tests, which is not the best measure, there's a national, edu national NAEP, National Something Assessment of Educational Progress. They take a scientific sample of students and test them. It's a random sample. So you're not teaching to the test in class time, and they get a sense of where you are on those standard measures. It's been going on for decades. It's a, you know, gives a good apples and apples comparison. That's all we need. We don't need this testing itself as an industry. And we've got to get these leeches out of our public schools and go back to fully funding them, letting the teachers be professionals. They know what they're doing. They're trained to do it. They will design tests for the students to, you know, help them learn the, the material they're trying to learn. And, uh, and then the other thing is segregation. And, and let me just say a little bit more about that. Uh, we're talking about controlled choice, where you have districts where you have a diversity within those districts. In New York City, you already got that. Around the state, you're going to have to redraw district lines so that you have both low income and middle income, black and white, and so forth, uh, people in the same districts. And then the students and the parents choose their schools, order them, rank them in preference, and then you give them the highest preference you can while also making sure every school is balanced by socioeconomic mm -hmm. background. And what we know when you have that kind of integration, it's better educational outcomes. The low, lower income uh, students really come up, the middle class kids do just as well on standardized tests, and they all do better on things like intellectual self-confidence, creativity, problem solving, tolerance, teamwork. I mean, all these things that, <clears throat> if you wanna get in the middle class professional occupations are so important, and are just good social skills for everybody to have and to be active citizens in our society. So uh, I chose GLE to be my running mate because I think Cuomo's educational policies are, are certainly in the running for being his worst policies. Uh, there's some competition there, but education, and I know many people are very concerned between the big opt-out movement, the underfunding of our schools, and we have to sue the state, and Cuomo is resisting in court, from fully funding our schools and nobody's talking about segregation. So that's why I'm glad to have G as my running mate. Next question, do you support Medicaid support for doulas uh, who are people who help uh, women give birth? They're different than midwives and the evidence shows they give, there are better outcomes with birth. So I say, yes, when we get to a single payer system, it will provide all medically necessary services. And I believe this is a medically necessary service. Brian asks, can you tell us about your vision for New York? Broad question. And you know, the broad vision I outlined we call it the Green New Deal for New York. And we want it's basically economic rights to housing, education, health care. Um, and there's one more. Housing, education, healthcare, and well, the basic things that you need to have a decent standard of living. Plus, we've got to 
get to 100% clean energy because we're on the crest of this climate change. Oh, of course, employment or income. And that's probably the first one. So we have programs in each of those areas. I don't want to go through them in detail because uh, I don't want to take too much time on any one question. If you go to my website, howiehawkins.org, there's a issues section with a long platform uh, that talks about the Green New Deal as well as a lot of the other issues. I will say that uh, criminal justice reform is a high priority. Uh, we need to abolish bail. We need speedy trial, police law, actually a stronger version of police law that the, the uh, criminal justice advocates are calling for. That's for speedy trial. Full discovery, which we don't have in this state, but states like Texas do, we're supposed to be progressive. Uh, we've got to have presumptive uh, parole. In other words, unless the parole board finds a good reason to keep you in, we get you out and back into society to serve you paid your dues. There's a whole range of them, and we got to reduce the prison population, which is just ballooned, mainly because of the war on drugs, but also just the whole law and order, uh, you know, uh, bent that the country went on. And uh, crime rates are down. We should not have more people incarcerated in the United States than any other country in the world, including very repressive countries around the world. All right, Andrew asks, will Cuomo, Nixon, or Hawkins take New York State to 100% renewables by 2050? And Andrew, as I explained earlier, 2050 is too late. The Climate and Community Protection Act is a farce. We have a better bill, the New York Off Act, to get to 100% uh, clean energy by 2030. It's got real benchmarks in there, like no uh, building after 2020 can be built unless it's carbon neutral. By 2025, all vehicles have to be uh, zero emissions. Uh, every community of 50,000 or more, every government in a jurisdiction of 50,000 or more people has to have a climate action plan that's integrated into the state plan to get us there. That's what we need to do. And the call for 100% clean energy by 2050 is frankly irresponsible given the climate crisis we're, we're entering into. And Nixon did not talk about education issues, could have mentioned it instead of answering scripted questions submitted by Cuomo. And I don't know about the scripted questions submitted by Cuomo, maybe you know something more than me. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, Nixon talked about the funding or the inequity of the funding, not the total amount of funding, not the problem with this high stakes, I call it the test, punish, privatize, and segregate regime because that's what high stakes testing leads to in the proliferation of the charter industry and segregation. And uh, again, I don't wanna spend a long time because these are issues that we can really go into depth on. Again, on my website are not just the platform positions, but a lot of statements and news releases and the, the search function. And you can find out what we've been saying about these education issues. Carmen says, stop home attendance slavery in New York State, which I did speak about. I had court this case that began today and uh, the, the unjust regulation that Cuomo's Department of Labor is uh, putting on people. And Jack asks, what will you do to ensure home health aides who work 24 hour shifts are paid their full 24 hours? Well, I wanna do more than pay them for the full 24 hours, which of course, I would rescind that regulation in the Department of Labor. I would make 24 hour shifts illegal. I would make any time over eight hours uh, overtime or 40 hours a week paid overtime, time and a half. And uh, I, those are the changes that I'd like to see. And I, I have been working with uh, those home attendant in the campaign to get this terrible Department of Labor regulation repealed. Remember, it was three court decisions that said this is illegal and the Department of Labor cited federal decisions by right-wing judges that Bush or Trump appointed to make its case that they can keep this uh, 24 hours work for 13 hours pay. And uh, now they're fighting it in court. Again, that's another case where Cuomo has his attorney general doing the wrong thing. And I, I would mention that our attorney general uh, candidate, Michael Sussman, really will be independent. If, if I told him to do that, he'd tell him to take a hike same with the school funding issue. Jim asks, do you believe there will be more inclusive, inclusive televised debates following the primary day, September 13th? I do believe that. 
I was included in the 2010 and 2014 debates as the Green Party candidate. I believe Governor Cuomo will ask for that because he wants as many of us running against him on there as possible to divide us up as much as possible. Uh, but that's fine with me because I think when we get to the fall, there will be one candidate who's the progressive candidate standing with the people on these issues. That would be me and the Green Party candidate ticket. Uh, there will be one or two, or actually three, Clinton Democrats. That would be Cuomo, Stephanie Minor, who was a Clinton Democrat and now running on the Serve America movement, and Nixon if she stays in, and then two conservatives. So that's fine with me, because I think when people hear our positions, they the majority of them will come to us. So the majority stands with us on things like single payer health care, uh, fully funding education, making sure everybody's got a decent home to live in, a job guarantee if you are can't find a job in the private sector, or an income above poverty if you can't work or shouldn't work because you're taking care of you know little children, or you shouldn't work because you're disabled or sick or injured or too old or too young. So I think, and everybody's concerned about climate change. It doesn't come at the top of the list when people ask priorities on polling, but everybody's worried about it, almost everybody. The climate deniers have got their heads in the sand. So next question, how can you find candidates in our regions that share our values? How can we see what each stands on? Uh, that's a problem. I wish we had more greens running. And you go to a lot of these candidates' websites and cannot contact them. I actually had a New York Times, a former New York Times reporter, pretty prominent reporter, I'm not gonna say his name, contact me trying to get all of Cynthia Nixon because he couldn't get it off the website. That's typical, that's a problem. And then candidates don't put a lot of issues on their, on their uh, web pages. I've tried to be very uh, transparent, you know, the conventional wisdom is the more you say, the more reason people have to have a difference with you. But I just believe people should know where you stand we're not all going to agree on everything, but, you know, uh, you know, decide, you know, who stands with you more than the others. So that's a problem. And, uh, you know, my answer to that is we've got to get more Greens ready to run and running and, and putting forward the kind of vision we're talking about here tonight. Edwin asks, what would a Hawkins administration contrast from dealing with NYCHA backlog of repairs and the $32 billion debt? Well, it's about the money. Um, there are problems in NYCHA's administration. I think that reflects it having a low priority from these so-called progressive Democrats, Mayor de Blasio and Governor Cuomo. Uh, there's been a lot of pressure on that, thanks to the media, the Daily News in particular, and New York One. I appreciate that, because now there seems to be some attention to it. Now the feds are involved. Um, but I think money is the thing that's not being said. Nixon said last week that she'd find another billion dollars a year. You need $32 billion in five years, according to NYCHA's capital plan, to get the mold and let out, fix the elevators, roofs, and, uh, and boilers. Um, and then we want to expand public housing. So that comes back to progressive tax reform and having this 1% in our state in particular pay more. They're getting $375 billion a year, 30% of all the income. If you had 100 pennies and you pulled out about a third of them and put them in your pocket, and you're sitting in a room with 100 people, and then you threw those other 70 pennies for the 100 people to fight over, some of them wouldn't get any. A few would get several, and most would get like one. That's the way our income is distributed in the state, and that is not a way to have a healthy economy or a fair society. So that's why we've got to have more tax reform and start doing things like public enterprise, and work with co-ops. That's why we're calling ourselves ecological socialists. Capitalism not only is destroying the climate by this competitive drive for endless growth, which is consuming the environment, it also is exploiting workers and not paying them what they produce. And that's why the rich are getting richer, as we've seen since 1980, and the rest of us are frozen in place while our cost of living is going up and we're struggling to pay the bills. So poverty kills too. We've known for a long time that people of color tend to have lower income and lower life expectancies. What's happened since the Great Recession in 2008 is that the white working class has been going down too, and their life expectancies are going down. So poverty kills, and this is an issue that you know should be of great concern. Uh, Susan says, I want to see welfare reform in counties such as Rockland, 
and whole villages are on welfare, such as Curious Joel at 95%. That is a burden in the form of taxes on us. What will Howie do for this? Um, Rockland and Orange, Curious Joel is a unique circumstance. Um, and I don't know other villages in, that, in those two counties that where they're all on welfare. Um, people get on welfare, now it's time limited uh, and it's inadequate if you really need it, it doesn't bring you up to the poverty line. So I don't begrudge people getting public assistance when they need it. Now, Curious Joel is trying to game the system and that's a unique circumstance. And I think what they're doing is wrong and needs to be looked into. Uh, Joe says, no one should ever be elected with less than 50% of the vote. Support ranked choice voting. Absolutely. Ranked choice voting is where you rank your candidates in order of preference. So uh, you might prefer Howie Hawkins, Green Party, the progressive candidate, the socialist candidate, number one. But you don't want Molinero to win because I've taken votes from the middle, Molinero being the Republican. You can rank Nixon or Cuomo or Minor, I guess. Second, I mean, tough choice, but you know, take your pick. And then if I didn't uh, win the election, I came in last, my votes will be distributed to my second, to the second choices of my voters. And you continue that process until the candidate gets over 50%. That's much better than what we might have in this election, which is a plurality, a small low plurality electing the next governor. And I would like to see ranked choice voting for the legislature in the form of proportional representation, where you have multi member districts like. 10 uh, member districts. Uh, so you'd have for the assembly 150 members, 15 10 member districts around the state. And then you rank your choices in order of preference. And then any candidate in that case, it gets a little over 10% of, of preferences as the votes were distributed, uh, would get into the legislature. That means a party that like the Green Party might get 15, 20, 25% of the vote, we would get 15, 20, 25% of the seats. The way it is now, in any particular dis district with single members, the majority party is elected pretty much automatically. So we don't even have competitive elections. And we have one party districts with a two party system. And it's, it's like the old Soviet Union, one party system, except it's slicker. It gives the illusion of choice. But when you have uh, majority rules and single member districts, winner take all, uh, you end up with single, single party districts. And that is not very democratic. So yeah, that kind of electoral form is definitely needed. And uh, what will I do as governor to combat corruption in Albany? Well, I mentioned full public campaign financing. I mentioned limiting outside income for legislators. Uh, close these loopholes, the LLC loophole, full disclosure, all those things. Reopen the Moreland Commission and uh, you know go after the public corruption like it was and left those files for free for our who caught a bunch of people but I really doubt that uh, they fully did the job because there are just too many shady deals going on. I mean, just to cite one I know about here in Syracuse, there was a public housing project, project-based Section 8 development called Kennedy Square, 409 units. It was actually a former resident right over there. And uh, that was torn down and the site remains a weed-strewn lot with no affordable housing built in its place and the property was conveyed to core development by the state with no money down and no bid. And this is the same company that got convicted of uh, one of their principles of bribing uh, Joe Pococo and then they got caught in the bid rigging up in the Buffalo Billions case. What really happened there? How did they get that? No money down, no bid. Uh, and this is a project that was touted by Pococo, Cuomo, uh, what's his name? Uh, Carriolos, what's the first name? You know, the, the economics are that he got convicted in the Buffalo Billion, as well as a lot of local politicians and these people from poor. And right now, there's stuff, nothing's happened in about 10 years. So, uh, yeah, re reopen the corruption investigation. Oh, and Jay Cope. Jay Cope's got, a, you know, Jay Cope, a joint committee on political ethics, is a body uh, set up by the politicians to govern the politicians. It's toothless and they set it up that way on purpose. We need independent uh, ethics oversight. And uh, so those are some of the things we can do about corruption. And I would say elect politicians that don't take corporate money like Green Party politicians. 
The two corporate parties are full of money, get all their money, or most of their money from uh, corporate interests, and uh, the results speak for themselves. We got the best government money to buy. Rob says, better government costs something. I'm in full support of paying for what we get. Yes, and paying up front with taxes on the rich instead of going into debt on the bar market and paying them the rich more money with interest. Susan says, school funding formula in each Ramapo, two thirds of children go to private schools. The public kids are not getting enough funds because they need to pay for busing, books, special ed. That's totally unfair. I agree that I believe is what's going on in uh, the Curious Joel community. And that's where this uh, religious community took over this local government and basically controls the public funding and they're diverting it to private schools. And it's a real problem. I, I, it's something that the state has let go along. Another issue related to that is these yeshivas that are not educating children. And uh, they began an investigation and 15 of them just wouldn't let anybody in. And uh, so former students from the yeshivas are uh, complaining and I believe they're in a lawsuit uh, because if a school's only certified by the state, it should provide those children with a sound base of education. They're coming out, some of them illiterate, enumerate, with no knowledge of civic, civic affairs or history, just no education, except the religious education, and that is unacceptable. Colin says, no change will ever come from supporting the system existing system. We need change, we need more parties, we need public alternatives. I'm not going to argue with you, uh, Colin. Uh, Daniela asks, do you think Cynthia Nixon is really a socialist, or do you think she will run on the WFP line if she loses the Democratic primary? Uh, well, socialism today for some people is if it's a government program, it's socialist. If it's private, it's not. That's not really what the socialist tradition is about. It's about economic democracy. A cooperative in the private sector is socialist. And if you have a public enterprise that's not democratic, it's not socialist. Um, so, but she totally misses the, the social ownership as the basis for economic democracy and how economic democracy is the basis for political democracy. Because if wealth is concentrated, the rich not only buy elections with campaign funds, they can defund governments by withholding credit. You know, every government needs a line of credit because tax revenues come in intermittently and you got to meet payroll. And they have forced people out of office, like Dennis Kucinich in Cleveland when he was the board mayor. He ran on the promise of not privatizing the public power utility, and he actually kept his promise. So the bank said, okay, your line of credit is cut off and bankrupt the city immediately, forced him out of office. So these are the kinds of problems that we, we face up against. And I don't think uh, Cynthia Nixon has much schooling in that realm. Um, and Cuomo said, oh, Carmen says, <laughs> Cuomo should ask me this. Carmen says, tell us about your social plan to fix your economy, please. Okay. Uh, the Green New Deal are social programs to uh, secure economic rights, but public enterprise is key to a lot of those. Uh, one would be in the energy sector. To get to 100% clean energy, we need to take over the energy system. We have 50 municipal power utilities in the state. They provide power at lower cost and more reliability than the IOUs, the investor-owned utilities like National Grid and Con Air. Uh, we need <clears throat> public broadband. I mean, the state wants spectrum, charter to sell spectrum. We want the state to take over spectrum so we can have community broadband like 750 other communities in, in this country do. They provide better service at lower cost under community control. And that's you know what we need, democratic. So like in my city of Syracuse, our public access is terrible. Public education and government channels, we don't have them. In uh, Spectrum, before that time, Warner, uh, our franchise agreement ran out over 10 years ago and they don't negotiate in good faith. So we're stuck with this bad franchise and no means to enforce it. So that's why we want community broadband. Another area is housing. I mentioned public housing. Healthcare, the insurance should be public. That's the single payer system. So these, these are public ownership of the means of production or social insurance at least. And finally, we need a public bank. It makes no sense for the state to deposit its money in these big Wall Street banks when we can finance infrastructure for half the cost of going through them with bonding and paying their commissions. 
by doing it like what North Dakota does. They've had a state bank for 100 years. They finance their infrastructure at half the cost. They bypass Wall Street. They are not part of the Federal Reserve System. And they use their own revenues as deposits and reserves for making investments. And they fund the farms, the businesses, the student loans, mortgages. And they do it in partnership with real community banks. North Dakota has more community banks than any state in the country because the state bank, the public bank, has worked with them. And they work with credit unions. These, the thing about a community bank, as opposed to a Wall Street bank, a Wall Street bank, if you're a local business person who wants to borrow money, they come in with a cookie cutter template. They have no idea about your character, your relationships in the community, the assets that are intangible you can bring. They just look at your financials and your assets and they reject a lot of good offers and probably approve some where the character is bad. A community bank, on the other hand, has a relationship. So do credit unions. So there's a lot of things that a public bank can do. But we, oh, and finally, uh, you know, we're not forcing people to convert their businesses to cooperatives. We want to make it easy for them to do it. The public bank should have a uh, entrepreneurial division that does planning of uh, new worker cooperatives, provides technical assistance to worker cooperatives, and helps finance them. That's what they did in the minor ground cooperative network in Spain. They have the Bank of People's Labor at the center of that network. It's now an endowed institution, not a bank. But they do the planning, and they made over, uh, developed over 100 industrial cooperatives. And all but two of them are successful. It's like over 98% success rate. In this country, after five years, only about 20% of business startups are still operating. So that is a good business development plan. Now, you know, we're not going to shut down businesses that keep wage labor in our capitalist enterprises. Uh, but if they're, you know, the owners are, you know, aging out of business, we want to enable them to sell it to their workers rather than to another business. We can do things like that. And for those that remain, uh, we want to gradually socialize ownership so that everybody in New York across the board has a share in that ownership. So we want to put public money into the securities of corporations, like a sovereign wealth fund in Norway or any other country, and gradually make those assets public where every <coughs> citizen will get a citizen's dividend, their equal share of the social ownership, and also use some of that money for the general fund and use it to reduce taxes on the earned wage income of working people. So those are some of the things we would do to move toward a socialist, a democratic economy. And then Razi asked, Cuomo stated, Dems did nothing to push policy when they held the Senate and the House. How would you change this if you could? You know, ironically, he was right about that. And that's something I often point out about the Democrats. You go back to Roosevelt in the first enunciation of this economic bill of rights I'm talking about. And every president, Truman, uh, Kennedy, Johnson, Carter, Clinton, and Obama had at least a two-year period, and early on, several years, like with Johnson and Kennedy, where they had majorities of both houses. And the Democrats would put, you know, single payer health care, they call it national health insurance, a job guarantee, they called it full employment. Um, and you know the right to housing and so forth uh, in their platform, but then when they had the power to do it, they never did. It. And we had that uh, situation in 2009 and 10. Uh, I would say if I get elected as a Green, I will have a powerful mandate because I'm not getting elected because I got the most money or I got the biggest machine out there. I will get elected because people like my platform. And that mandate, I will go to the legislature and say, look. You know, you can work with this, us in this mandate, or you can have people run against you in two years. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't do that as a threat. I'd just point out the reality and uh, see what we can get done. And, you know, there's no guarantees, but I think, you know, that's practical policy, getting things done. And uh, that's what we'll have to do, whoever gets elected. So Gloria asks, what are some of your electoral reform proposals beyond ranked choice voting and proportional representation? Uh, we should change the ballot. We have fusion, but we have it unlike any of the other seven states that have fusion. That's cross endorsement. Where we cross endorse, every time you get a new endorsement, you get another ballot line. In other states, when you cross endorse, your name appears once, and in the parties that endorse, you appear underneath your name. And that, right now, our ballot is cluttered. We have eight ballot line parties 
that only three candidates created those eight parties. I created one with Brian Jones in 2014 and uh, with Gloria Matera in 2010 uh, by getting enough votes for the Green Party, over 50,000. And then Cuomo both times and Paladino and then Astorino got enough votes for the other parties. All the other parties are basically, they, they don't run their own candidates. They cross endorse major party candidates. And that, I think, confuses the voters. So I would reform the ballot in that respect and also reform it so instead of the party that gets the most votes always being at the top, every race should have its own sheet. And then the candidates should be listed at random so that there's not a bias toward the candidate at the top, which is now always the Democrat. Uh, the ballot should be accompanied by uh, information booklets sent out by the uh, Board of Elections to all voters. Every candidate, every party should have a 250 word statement about what they would do, why they're running, what they're about. Um, and actually, I've seen this done. It's done this way in California. The booklets, the ballots with each office having its own sheet in random ordering. They don't have fusion out there, that's another question, but it's easy to do uh, on, the, on the ballot sheets. So ballot reform, um, boy, there are a number of things. Uh, my platform, again, go to my website. We, we got a lot of ideas about uh, you know, election reforms. The Board of Elections should be nonpartisan, civil service, professional, not a patronage job for the two major parties who then use it to protect their interests in a lot of counties and at the state level. Um, redistricting, that should also be nonpartisan. If we go to proportional representation, it won't be such a big issue because you have multi-member districts and uh, the boundaries won't have such an impact like they do now. But even then, that should be done by objective standards without the parties you know, drawing out safe districts and they divide the areas up amongst themselves. So you get overwhelmingly Democratic districts here and overwhelmingly Republican districts there. They're all one party districts and there's no political competition. So those are some of the electoral reforms. What is my position on nuclear power, Ursula asked. Do you think we need to get it to car do we need it to get to carbon free energy by 2030? Uh, no, we do not. The New York off fossil fuels bill, 100% clean energy by 2030. Nuclear power does not count as clean energy in that bill. And uh, yeah, we, I just had a letter published in the Syracuse Post Standard because the Trump administration here is touting Governor Cuomo's subsidies to keep poor aging upstate nukes alive. And so I'm very opposed to Governor Cuomo on that, who, who's counting that as carbon free energy. Uh, nuclear power wastes pile up. They're deadly for 250,000 years. If we had a serious accident here, we're downwind here from three nukes in uh, Oswego here in Syracuse. This area could be uninhabitable for 20,000 years. It's not worth the risk. We got to stop that. They're too expensive. They basically, we haven't built any since I helped organize an occupation of a nuclear power plant site in Seabrook in 1977. And now they've attempted it in the South and they're going bankrupt. I actually campaigned against them a few years ago. Um, so nuclear power is a dead end. It's dangerous and it's lower cost to go to solar wind and geothermal. So let's do it. One more has the money. Nixon is a multimillionaire. Nixon then hesitated, said yes, she would forego governor's salary. Would I take a salary cut? Traditional socialist position is to take the wage of an average worker in the state. That ties the public official to the fortunes of the average worker. That's what I would take. And I would use the rest of my salary uh, to donate to uh, movements in the cause for peace and justice and the environment. Um, I couldn't afford to take no salary because I'm a working stiff and I got a small pension. I'm technically retired if I'm not elected governor I may be back at UPS working for 1040 an hour. God, I'll just tell you this. This is what other people are going through, and I know what they're going through. Uh, my pension originally was supposed to be $2,400 a month. When I retired at 62, I retired at 65. It's ten thousand. It's $1,000 60, including a 20% cut we just took because of some laws, some damn Democrats with the Republicans made at the federal level. The, 
The consolation prize for that cut in my pension is I can go back to work, but I lose my seniority, start over at the minimum wage, which is 1040, which is a poverty wage, but it's better than nothing. And with the pension, it'll help. So, but I'd rather be elected governor. So help me out there. Um, so those are all, oh, one more question. And then it's time to wrap up. Uh, Nixon says Cuomo only pushed for $15 an hour because she was, he, he was pressured. And aren't you and the Greens the ones who did that pushing politically? Yes, we are. Uh, I think we were out there first in, in the campaigns to call for it. Uh, it's a big issue in 2015. We weren't talking about the slow uh, turtles pace that we're getting to 15. We're talking about 15 within a couple of years. And here we are four years later, and the minimum wage here where I am is 1040, and I may be working for that in a few months. Um, and I'm going to put out a proposal on Labor Day on why we should now aim for $20 an hour shortly and get to $30 an hour by 2030. Basically, if the minimum wage had kept pace with productivity, it would be about 28 bucks an hour if the minimum wage had kept pace since 1968. You know, productivity is how much we produce in an hour. It's a measure of that. And our wages have been stagnant. Productivity has gone up to 1% of capture. Uh, the bosses can afford to pay more in wages, and people need to be paid a living wage so they can uh, basically pay their bills and have a decent life. So that's what we're talking about. So uh, those are all the questions there. I thank people, if you're still here, for hanging out with us. We've been here almost an hour. And uh, time flies when we're talking about important issues. So. I've been running all over the state. I've really been campaigning. I've been making myself available to the media, even though some of them are complaining that Nixon won't come on interviews, Cuomo won't come on interviews. I will, and I have, and I will. This call, um, and I've been, I've been out to Buffalo, Rochester. I've been in the Southern Tier. I'm going to be in the North Country tomorrow, as well as Albany and Glens Falls. I've been in New York City many times, in the Hudson Valley. I've been all over the state. I got something coming up in the Cattaraugus County. So I'm campaigning statewide, I'm working hard, and I appreciate the people that are supporting us. And those of you that are considering it, go to our website, howiehawkins.org, and there you can figure out how to send us a message. Uh, you can volunteer, we'll get in touch with you, you can donate. And so thanks for watching and have a good night.